Has anybody ever had a toilet that's been backed up? But has toilet ever been backed up? Amen. <laughs> I'm asking because I need a plumber. Hey, man, I got a, I got a backed up toilet. <laughs> right? When the toilet backs up, right, you know what people tend to do is, is they tend to keep flushing it. They keep trying to pull the lever and see if, if whatever's backing it up will go through and will, will create a flow. And so what, 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 what we tend to do is, is, is when we continue to pull the lever, what happens is that water rises, and overflows. And whatever was in the toilet comes flowing out of the toilet. And it affects everything in that room. Doesn't it? Amen. Hallelujah. Right? You got to get your mop and you got to get some ammonia and you, you got to get some cleaning solution to get that stuff up. You see, here in, in, in the life of this community, in this, in this body of people, they were backed up. Their life was filled with blockage. Their life was filled with bitterness, with sorrow, with sin, with anger, and with malice. And what we need is not to keep pulling the lever. What we need to do is go out in the garage and get the plunger. You know what a plunger does? It pushes pressure into the, the toilet, and it causes the pressure to flow into the, to the, to the piping, and it moves the blockage so that there is, is, is a flow. And what we do is, 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 is if, if the flow isn't, isn't overwhelming, if the blockage, rather, isn't overwhelming, what we can do is we can get a, a pot of water. You see, some of, some of you remember before we had plumbing systems, and you could just flip a lever and the water flow through. What'd you do? You'd go fill a pot of water. And you take it, you get a bucket, right? You bring your bucket into the house, and what'd you do? You dump the water into the toilet. You know what we need from God? We need to stop trying to be better people. We need to stop trying to do good and do right. We need to stop trying to fix our life. We need to stop trying to, to make it work on our own terms and in our own ways. We need to look to God, and we need to ask God to bring the bucket of water. We need to ask God to bring the Holy Spirit, and we need to ask God to pour it into our plumbing system and evacuate the blockage so that we can flow and so that we can see clearly His presence and so that we can experience His power and so that we can see God what we need is downpour. You see, prayer is the plunger to the heart. You want to know why your heart is filled with so much trouble? It's because you don't enter into the presence of God. When you enter into the presence of God, God by His Spirit begins to plunge your life. He begins to push the bitterness, the sorrow, the shame, the guilt, the remorse. He begins to push the pride out of your inner life and He aligns you with Him. The prayer is the plunger to the heart. The Word of God is the plunger to the mind. You wonder why we're so crazy? Because we sit and we, we, we meditate on things that are not of God. The, the Apostle Paul, he would say, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are good, if there be any praise. He said, think on these things. You see, some of us have, in, have taken in what, 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 what my pastor used to call stinking thinking. The way that we perceive ourselves, the way that we perceive the people of God, the way that we perceive the world, the way that we perceive the circumstances that happen to us, it's stinking thinking. And what we need is the word of God. The Bible says that our mind is renewed by the washing, by the waters of the word. And so when we get into the word of God, it is there that God begins to plunge our mind and he begins to pour in truth. Prayer is the plunger of the heart. The word of God is the plunger to the mind, but the gospel is the plunger to the soul. You see, you wonder why, you, you, if, if, if you have yet to turn to Jesus, 
The world is in a search for redemption. The world is in a search for meaning. The world is in a, in a search for purpose. And I'm submitting to you that when we believe the gospel, that God takes this message of his son and he, plunge, he, 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 he pours it into the soul and he plunges, he, he vacates the blockage in our soul. When we believe the gospel, that is when we're forgiven. That is when we're made whole. That is when we don't have to worry about the past anymore. We don't have to worry. Listen, you can't make the past better but you can make the future brighter. And the way you do that is when you believe the gospel and you yield to God, God purges, God plunges the soul. You see, God wants to plunge us, but we have got to take the plunge into God. Anybody ever go to the pool before? There's this really cool diving technique and it's called a cannonball. Unique. I mean, they don't do this, this at the Olympics because it's one of the best uh, styles that you could ever do in, in Olympics and, and, and in professional diving. And so they reserve that for recreation. But, but they don't do it in, in the Olympics because whoever does this, uh, it, it would just be a perfect score. And so they, they, can't, they can't just have everybody doing this cannonball because everybody would get a perfect score and we wouldn't be able to distinguish who's better from who. And so I digress. But you've heard of a cannonball before, right? What happens is you, you, you take this plunge into the water and you ball yourself up and you land in the water and you create this great big splash. You see, there are many of us who in our relationship with God, we're, we're worried about the temperature of the water. We're worried about what's going to happen and what we're going to look like if we go get in the water. My wife and I, for our anniversary earlier in June, we uh, went to uh, Casa del Mar in Daytona, and, and or rather Ormond Beach, and, and, and we were in the pool, and there was a gentleman who was already in the pool. We were just trying to get a couple minutes in there. They were closing in about 20 minutes or so, and so we didn't want to let a vacation go to waste and not experience the pool, and so we went to the pool, and I get to the, to the edge of the, uh, of, the, of the pool, and there's a, a, a staircase or whatever, stairwell, and I begin going in one step at a time, and this, this, this elderly gentleman looks over at me, and this is an older gentleman. This isn't a young guy. This is somebody older. He says, jump in. The water's fine. <laughs> he was already he was over there sitting in the corner, and he was having himself a good time, and you know what? When I got in the water, it wasn't as bad in the water as I thought it was when I was out of the water. You see, the, Christ, the Christian life isn't as bad as you think it is. It's actually far better than you anticipated. There's more peace, there's more joy, there's more hope, there's more purpose, there's more love, there's more in Christ himself. And so you don't have to step in one foot at a time. You don't have to see if the water's okay. You don't have to feel and see if it's warm enough. Listen, go ahead. Your body will adjust. Your life will adjust. Just go ahead and jump into the pool and let that water come running over you. Let there be a downpour and watch God change your life. You see... Satan is the one who tells us that water is not good. Don't get in that water. And it's Jesus saying, don't worry. The water is just fine. It's not as bad as you think. You can take the plunge. Here in this text in Acts chapter number 2, there's a fulfillment of, of, a, of the prophecies of both the prophet Joel in Joel chapter 2 and the prophet Hosea in Hosea chapter 6. And, and it, is, it, is, it is literally a reversal of this curse. And you'll find that as you read and as you continue reading through, through Acts chapter number 2, you'll find that, that the, 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 the people, these Jewish people, they perceive that the disciples, the apostles included, are drunk. Like, you guys are drunk. You are out of your mind. And that is why you're, you've, you've somehow, through this bottle, found a way to speak a language you've never learned. Man, I wish that I could drink a beverage and learn a language, don't you? Right? When you go to, to the nail parlor and they start speaking in Mandarin. Ho hold on, hold on one second. <laughs> Say that again? Wouldn't that be cool? Right? 
We, we were, we were, we were in, in, a, in a clothing store yesterday, and there was, a, there, were, there was a gentleman and his wife, and they were from the Middle East, and, and, and they, they were speaking, uh, they, they, they sounded like, like, like they were speaking uh, Hebrew or Yiddish. And, and so, so I, I, I just wished, I'm like, I don't know what they're talking about. I wonder what they're plotting, what they're, what they're you know, maybe they're having an argument, you know, maybe they're, they're disagreeing, and I couldn't tell. And I wish that I could just ha- say, hey, babe, pass me the soda, and got the soda, and drank the soda, and immediately could speak and understand understand Yiddish and Hebrew. And so here we, we, we see that there is this fulfillment of prophecy and there is this reversal, if you will, of a curse that we see previously in the Bible. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to the book of Joel, Joel chapter 2. Turn to Joel. It's, it's, it's in the latter part of the Old Testament. Again, you can use your, your uh, table of contents to Find your way. You have Daniel, you have Hosea, then you have right after Hosea, you have Joel. Joel chapter number two. Notice while you're turning there, here's what Joel, he he prophesies. He says, blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. Let me ask you a question. When God speaks, do you tremble? Is there, is there a fear, a reverence for the word, the presence of God, for the day of the Lord cometh? He says, for it is nigh at hand. He's not saying that it's distant. He's saying it's near. We preach and we teach the imminency of the coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus could come today. My question is, if Jesus came today, would you be ready? A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it. Even to the years of many generations, a fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness." Yea, and nothing shall escape them. He's talking about the Assyrian, the the nation of Assyria. There's going to be this invasion, and this invasion is going to sweep through all of Israel, and is going to leave what once looked like the Garden of Eden. It's going to leave it burned and barren. He says the appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. He goes on and he says, before their face, the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. He's saying there's going to be sorrow and grief. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war and they shall march every one of his own ways. They shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk everyone in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. These are going to be men who even when you wound them with weapons, they're going to seem like they just keep coming. Sounds like night of the living dead, doesn't it? They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. And the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart. Now, don't miss this. God's saying in the midst of this adversity, don't, don't turn to the enemy. Don't turn to the, adverse, the adversary. Don't turn to the trouble in your life. He says, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. Notice what he says, and rend your heart and not your garments. You know what we have a tendency to do? We have a tendency to rend our garments and not our hearts. I was listening to another pastor who talked about his experiences dealing with people who respond to adversity and tragedy in their life. And he was saying that the the often narrative of how they handle adversity is when God does things that they don't expect, they often come to church. Death in the family, people come to church. Loss of a job, people come to church. Something goes wrong, people come to church. He said, and the, and, and, and the proclamation is, hey, God's trying to get my attention. He says he sees them on average two to three weeks before they're gone. He says, you know what it is? It's not that, that, that they didn't rend their garments. It's that they didn't rend their heart. 
And so what Joel is saying is that if we're going to experience the downpour, the overflow of God, we must rend our, our heart and not our garment. He goes on and he says this. He says, who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him? He says, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord our God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. He's saying, blow the trumpet. Call everybody to assembly. Bring them together. Sanctify. Set apart a fast. Bring us together in one accord. Be, not, not so that we can, we can see the, the, the miracles of God, but so that we can see God. I want you to get this in your mind. This is what's happening in the inner chamber. This is what's happening in this upper room. These are people who have assembled together and they're not looking for a blessing a, a, a they're not looking for the hand of God they're looking for the face of God and so here's what he's saying gather them together sanctify the congregation assemble the elders gather the children and those that suck the breast let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet let the priests the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar and let them say spare thy people O Lord and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them wherefore should they say among the people where is their God he says then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people yea the Lord will answer unto and say unto his people behold I will send you corn and wine and oil and ye shall be satisfied therewith let me ask you, are you satisfied with what God has given you, or do you desire more? Behold, he says, he says, and ye shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen, but I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the ut utmost sea, and his stink shall come up. And his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things. He says, fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. You believe that today? Do you believe that God will do great things? He says, uh, be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. He says, be glad then. Ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. You see the downpour? And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil, and I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, and the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that have dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward, watch this, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Notice this is happening in Acts chapter 2. God is pouring out his spirit. You want to know why you can't see clearly? You want to know why there's a blockage? You want to know why there's challenges and difficulties? You want to know why there's hindrances? It's because God is trying to plunge your life. He's trying to clear your life, and he's trying to pour his spirit into it. He's trying to insert himself into your life, and you are still flipping the lever of life. And we must turn to God not only is this a fulfillment of promise, or rather of prophecy, here in Joel chapter 2, it is also a reversal of curses in Genesis. If you, if, in, in your spare time, you can turn to Genesis chapter number 6. The Bible says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So let me help you get this. There's a world that's filled with evil. Evil is the absence of good. Evil is the absence of God. And so here's what happens. There's a world that has removed God from its view. It's removed God from its, from its desire. It's removed God from its interest. And so here's what's happened. God looks upon the world and he says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to judge it. Uh, Genesis chapter 6 is the, is the chapter where Noah builds an ark. And here's what God does. He opens up the heavens and he pours a flood on the earth here's the reversal acts chapter 2 instead of God pouring water on the earth 
instead of God killing and destroying, God in his judgment pours out his spirit on the earth and he gives to the earth life. He gives to the earth the source by which it can have abundant life. He gives to the world comfort. And so what God is doing is he's saying in chapter 1, there was a curse. In chapter 2, there's a blessing. You see, while there are curses, God always ends with blessings. While you're going through hard times, there's always victory. While there's tragedy, there's always triumph. While there's hurt, there's always healing. And God always ends with healing. God always ends with triumph. God always ends with victory. If you don't believe me, go read the book of Revelations. With all of the trouble, we see victory. Not only do we see God reversing the curse here in Genesis chapter 6, we also see God reversing the curse of Genesis chapter 11. Here in Genesis chapter 11, the Bible says that the people, they build a city and they intend to build a tower. And here's what God does. He says, oh yeah, you're going to build a city. You're going to build a tower. You're going to get it to reach to heaven. So here's what I'm going to do. He says, let us, that is he, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they come down from heaven. And here's what they do. While everybody's sleeping, they, cha he, they, they, they change their languages. They confound the people. And so, so, so here's, here's what happens in Acts chapter number 2. Here's the reversal. While God initiated this confusion, this confounding because of the evilness of man, God in his mercy now pours out his spirit and provides clarity. Watch this. There were some 3,000 men here of varying places where they were from. While they were all Jewish by, 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 by birth, here's what God does. He combines instead of confuses their languages. He combines everything so that they can hear clearly the gospel. God is showing to us that he has the power, yes, to confound and yes, to curse. But he also is the God who can cure. He also is the God who can, clear, who can clear, who can provide clarity. He's also the God who can restore. And so I'm submitting to you in your life that the God that you seek, yes, he is a great and terrible God. Yes, he is a God of wrath and indignation. Yes, he is a God who is a God of judgment and of truth. Yes, he is a God who is able to do the most terrible things and allow man and his sin to deal with the consequences of his sin. But he is also a God who, who binds up. He's also a God who bandages. He's also a God who heals. He's also a God who restores. He's also a God who reconciles. He's also a God who brings clarity. He's also a God who blesses. He's also a God who provides. He's also a God who protects. He's also a God who is merciful, who is just, and who is good. And so here, the disciples are gathered in an inner chamber, and they're reflecting on the goodness of God. They're entering into his presence. Here, Acts chapter 2 is an ancient revival. It is dry ground becoming wet. It is dry bones coming to life. It is an awareness of the absence of God and the pursuit of his presence. It is a hunger and a thirst of the soul for the divine that is only nourished by God himself. The psalm writer David in Psalm 42, and somebody made a song of it. As the deer panted for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone does my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship Thee. That's the heart cry. It's not for God to give us stuff. It's for God to give us Himself. 
I want you, God. As a matter of fact, in, in, our, in our more contemporary circles, Carrie Job wrote this song, There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Then she said, I tasted and seen. Of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free, and my shame is undone. In your presence, Lord. Then, then she says, let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Can I give you some secrets? Here's the first one. We're not wanting God to show up. God's already here. God's already here. He's omnipresent. And it is we who are yearning for God to touch us and to tell us and to show us he's here. That's why the songwriter says, let us become more aware of your presence. J.I. Packer said this, Christians in revival are accordingly found living in God's presence he calls it the quorum deo, or the presence of God. He says that they are attending to God's word. See, there's a value in the word of God. You wonder why we don't experience revival. It's because we've, we've not placed an appropriate premium on the word of God. He says, feeling acute concern about sin and righteousness. You see, many times we want to come to God and we do not want to repent of sin. We want to bring our sin with us and we want God to accept us in our sin. No, God says that if we confess our sin, if we agree with him, that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. He says, rejoicing in the assurance of Christ's love and their own salvation. Do you see? Revival is when we are aware, when we are found in the presence of God, when we, when we place a premium, a high value on the Word of God, when we realize that we desperately need God and we are assured of His love and, and we see our salvation. And then he says, spontaneously constant in worship. You see, worship isn't just on Sunday. It is spontaneous and it is constant. You see, you can worship God in your car. When you look at that gas meter and you see that there's gas in the car, I don't care if it's on E, there's still gas in it. You can give God praise. When you put that key in the car and you turn and it starts, you can give God praise. When you're in your driveway and you put the key in the car and it doesn't start, you can, hey, listen, you could have been on I-95 when it broke down. You can give God praise. You see, when you look in your bank account and you see the dollars or you see just the cents in the bank account, you can give God praise. You see, you don't need to come to church to give God praise. You can give God praise wherever you are. You see, the Christian is a person marked not by just their praising God in assembly. It is by their praising and worshiping God wherever they go. 
You see, the early church was people that when they came into contact with community, there was something about them that was happy and excited. And they didn't have to be among other Christians to be happy and excited. They were looking to their Jesus, and they were happy, and they were excited. And people said, hey, what is it that you have that makes you happy and excited? And they turned around and said, we have Jesus. You see, it's spontaneous and it's constant, constant in worship and tirelessly active in witness. You see, one of the reasons why we lose this closeness to God is because we stop telling people about the goodness of God. You want to get close to God? Go find 10 things you're happy about. You ever heard the song, count your blessings, name them one by one? You know that song. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Right? We need to learn to count our blessings, and we need to not just count them and internalize them. We must count them and declare them. We must tell people that it is God who woke me up today. It is God who started me on my way. It is God who gave me the use and activity of my lips. It is God who gave me the clothes on my back and the food on my table. It is God who blessed me with the family that I have. It is God who's given to me the wisdom that I have, the experiences that I have, the, the, the expertise that I have. It is God who has opened my eyes to see truth. It is God who has led me. It is God who has prospered me. It is God God, who when I was in the pit, he pulled me up out of the pit. It is God who elevated me when I was in prison. It is God who blessed me, who prospered me. It is God who when I was doing stuff I had no business doing, he protected me, he kept me, he saw me through. It is him. And so we need to go and tell somebody just how good God is. Active in witness, active in service, fueling these activities by praise and prayer. So if we are going to experience this downpour of God, there are three things that we must have. You ready? The first one is we must have a common accord. Notice in Acts chapter number two, the Bible says that the disciples, if you will, they had come together. They were all in one with one accord in what? One place. The the word here used it, the, the Greek word, it is, it, it is hypo, that is same, and, and it is thumadon, that is, that is the same passion. You, you, let me help you get this. We don't have to be the same people. But when we come together, we must share hypo thumadon. We must share same passion. And here's what the passion was. The passion was for God to show up. Everybody assembled together. They wanted God to show up. My question to you is, have you come today seeking God? Have you come today desiring a word from God? Or have you simply come today to be entertained by this crazy preacher? (laughs) You came seeking God and you got a crazy preacher. Amen. You see, if we are going to, to, to witness the downpour of God, there must be hypothumadon. There must be same passions. We must assemble together. We must align ourselves. Now, let me help you get this. What I'm saying is not that we must align with worldview. It's not that, hey, listen, if you're a conservative, we all need to be a conservative. If you're a liberal, we all need to be a liberal. If you're a Democrat, we all need to be Democrats. If you're a Republican, we all need to be Republican. If you like the Golden State Warriors, we all need to like the Golden State Warriors. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that we all need to align ourselves under our common interests, that we all want to see God. Listen, I don't care if you're a Republican, do you want to see God? If you're a Democrat, do you want to see God? If you're a conservative, a liberal, do you want to see God? If you like the Golden State Warriors, the Houston Rockets, the New York Knicks, the the Philadelphia uh, uh, 76ers, the Pittsburgh Steelers, the New York Giants, the New York Jets, I don't care what team you like. My question is, do you want to see Jesus? And then we must also not only assemble, we not only must align, but we also must assent. We must hypothumadon in what we assent to. Here, here, let me help you get this. This this songwriter by the name of William McDowell, he wrote a song approximately three minutes long, and it says it's the same thing over and over. You ready? Here's what he says, the song. All I want is you. All I want is you, all I want is you. So you know what they were saying in this room, in this inner chamber? They were saying, all I want is you, 
All I want is you. 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 Watch this. The, the, the ascension happens. Seven weeks go by. 49 days happen. And then there's the 50th day, which is Pentecost. And so I'm submitting to you. Are you willing for the next seven, seven weeks, 49 days, to pray and ask God for all I want is you? I know you got a bill to pay. I know that there's a car note, and I know that there's trouble, and I know that you need healing, and I know that you need deliverance, and I know that you need answers to your problems, but for 49 days, all I want is you. All I want is you. All I want is you. Because here's the secret. Here's the other secret. If you get God, you get everything else. You see, when you get God, you get healing. When you get God, you get providence. When you get God, you get peace. When you get God, you get answers. You get wisdom. The Bible says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. It is God who gives wisdom. It is God who grants knowledge. It is God who gives peace. It is God who gives hope. It is God who gives love. It is God who gives answers to life's problems. And so I'm submitting to you that if you get God, you get everything. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. All I want is you. Here I have this book. You can see that I've read it quite a bit. Um, It's a really good book. It's entitled The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. And so I want to read this to you because this, this puts it into perspective. Here's what he says. He says, the impulse to pursue God originates with God. You see, it is not we who begin realizing that we need God. It is God who shows us that we need him. He says, but the outworking of that impulse is our following hard after him, that is, following hard after God. He says, all the time we are pursuing God, we are already in his hand. The psalm psalm writer said, thy right hand upholdeth me. In this divine upholding and human following, there is no contradiction. All is of God, for as von Hugel teaches, God is always previous. In practice, however, that is where God's previous working meets man's present response. Man must pursue God. On our part, there must be positive reciprocation. If the secret drawing of God is to eventuate an identifiable experience of the divine, in the warm language and personal feeling, this is stated in Psalm 42. Remember, we just sang that psalm. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth, thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? This is deep calling unto deep. He says, and the longing heart will understand it. He says, the doctrine of justification by faith, a biblical truth, and a blessed relief from sterile legalism and unavailing self-effort has in our time fallen into evil company and been interpreted by many in such a manner as as, as actually to bar men from the knowledge of God. He says, the whole transaction of religious conversion has become mechanical and spiritless. He says, faith may now be exercised without a jar or a ship to the moral life and without embarrassment to the Adamic ego. Christ may be received without creating any special love for him in the soul of the receiver. The man is saved, but he is not hungry nor thirsty after God. In fact, he is specifically taught to be satisfied and encouraged to be content with little. He says, he goes on, He says that we have been snared in the coils of this spurious logic that if we once we have found God, we need no more seek him. He's saying that what happens is that we fall into this trap. And here's the trap. He says religion, when it has said its final word, there is little that we need other than God himself. He says the evil habit of seeking God and effectively prevents us from finding God in full revelation. In the and lies our great woe. If we omit the and, we shall soon find God. And in him, we shall find that for which we have all our lives been secretly longing. He quotes the English classic, The Cloud of Unknowing, and he says, Lift up thine heart unto God with a meek stirring of love, and mean himself and none of his goods, 
and there to look thee loath to think on aught but God himself, so that not work in thy wit nor in thy will, but only God himself. This is the work of the soul that most pleaseth God. He's saying to us that we must all assent to God. We must all desire him and him alone. Not him and his goods. Not him and his hand, just him and his face. And we will find that when we find him, we find everything else we've been longing for. Not only must there be a common accord, but there must also be a common sound. Uh, anybody ever watched the, the, the movie Drumline? Th there was this theme in the movie Drumline. One band what? One band, one sound. One band, one sound. One band, one sound. So let me give you this picture. Let me help you understand what they were hearing in this, in this inner chamber, in this upper room, if you will. In, in the Old Testament, God, in the book of Joel, God talks about how the Assyrian army was going to come and they were going to ravage the land of Israel. And God uses this picture. He sends them signs before this happens. And the way that he shows them this picture is, is by sending in a swarm of locusts. Anybody ever hear a fly in their ear or a bee? Right? You hear, right? Right? You know when there's a bee nearby. Right? Can you imagine this great big swarm of locusts coming and flying in? You know what it would sound like? It would sound like an airplane. There was this large sound. So before this locust, this swarm of locusts would come in, they would hear a sound of a mighty rushing wind. And they could do nothing. There wasn't pesticide. There wasn't enough fly swatters to deal with the swarm. So all they could do is they could run and hide, and they had to yield to the swarm. And what would happen is these locusts would clear out an entire harvest. What was once green and filled with life would then be brown and desolate. And so here's what happens. God takes the curse and he reverses it and he gives them a blessing. They're sitting in this room and here's what they all hear. They hear this sound of a mighty rushing wind. In other words, they're realizing that something's going to happen that we don't have control over. We've got to surrender to God's move. And then God, in miraculous fashion, in, in, in tongues of cloven fire, he sits upon their tongue and he gives them the ability to speak languages they've never spoken before. Let, let me help you get this. When the Holy Spirit is, when you're full of the Spirit, you're yielded to the Spirit of God, here's what's going to happen in your life. The first thing that's going to happen in your life is heaven's message becomes clear. There's no more confusion. There's no, there's no lack of clarity. When you're walking with God and you're surrendered to God, what God says becomes abundantly clear. You don't have to guess. You don't have to wonder, well, God, is this you? God, is this what you want? You see, it, what happens is we get in the way. When you are yielded to the Spirit of God, what he wants for you is abundantly clear. That's what tongues was. These people were speaking in foreign languages, and here's what the reply was. We understand what they're saying. And here's what the message was when you go through the book of Acts chapter 2. When you see what they were preaching, they were preaching that you need to save yourself from this untoward generation. You need to be delivered. And the only hope of deliverance is not in your language, not in your money, not in your routine, not in your rituals, not in your religion. It's in none other than Jesus. The Bible says that there were many who believed and who were saved. So there was this common sound. The apostles heard the noise from heaven and they were empowered. The, the word used here, it is megaleos. In other words, the word that they used is they declared the wonderful works of God. You know what we need to do? We, we, don't, we, we, just, we, don't, need, we don't need more programs. We don't need more stuff. We just need a platform to, proclaim, to declare, to proclaim the wonderful works of God. You know what every song ought to be? The wonderful works of God. You know what every sermon ought to be? The wonderful works of God. You know what every program, every day, every event we conducted ought to be? The wonderful works of God. We should come together and we should fellowship with one another and we should rehearse the wonderful works of God. And so these people who thought that the disciples were crazy, they said that we understand what they're declaring and what they're declaring is the wonderful works 
of God. So there must be common accord, there must be common sound, and lastly, there must be common mission. I'm going to give you these quickly. They had common doctrine. The mission was to align with the proper doctrine, with the teachings of Jesus. It wasn't people who came together with this varying degree of what is right and what is wrong. You see, we live in a world where morality is subjective. They say, what you feel is right, but what I feel is right too. See, that wasn't the case here in the Word of God. They all had a common agreement on what was right and what was wrong. They understood what God says is right and what he says is wrong is wrong. They had common fellowship. The Bible says they broke bread together. I wonder how many of us are Christians who live in isolation, who never connect in fellowship, who never get together with other believers. You know, the statement goes that birds of a feather, what? Flock together. One of the reasons why people struggled so deeply in their relationship with Jesus is because they do not surround themselves with others who are following Jesus. They live in isolation, and in isolation, they are, they, are, they are more susceptible to the wiles, to the lure of Satan. The Bible says we are to confess our sins, our faults, one to another, that we're supposed to bear one another's burdens. And so what they did is they, 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 they became transparent, and they became vulnerable, and they connected in community. They fellowshiped together. They broke bread together. They shared their burdens together. They prayed one for another. They served each other. They had common fellowship. Not only did they have common doctrine and common fellowship, but the mission is also to have common discipline. Let me help you understand. Every believer, and, and I'm not, uh, listen, to what degree is going to be based on the depth of your relationship with God? Here's a spiritual discipline, prayer. If, if you're not praying, you'll, that's a part of the reason why you're not experiencing the overflow, the abundance of God, because you're not entering into God's presence. One of the disciplines of every believer should be, should be prayer. Another one of the disciplines of every believer should, 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 should be reading the Word of God. Notice the Bible says that they, that, they, that they learned together. They taught each other. They taught the words of Jesus. I was, I was sitting in this funeral yesterday, and the, the bishop preached an amazing message. And, and, and all I could say was, amen, and this is good. But my heart broke for the people in the room. Because I could sense that there were people in the room who were so focused on the fact that this loved one was dead and gone that they were missing out on this message. And, and, and this happens all the time in churches. There are people who are so focused on what they're getting ready to have for lunch. They're so focused on what work's going to be like tomorrow. They're so focused on what they got to do when they get home that they're missing out on the message. They're missing out on truth. They're missing out on deliverance. And so, so, so here's what I thought in my mind as he was preaching. People can't do better until they know better. You will never do better until you know better. And so, so here is, is what is important in the Christian life. As we read the word of God, we learn and we know better, then we can thereby do better because the inner life is transformed. There are many people who never open their Bible until Sunday morning when the pastor says, turn in your Bible. My question is, do we exercise common discipline? One of the common, another common discipline is the discipline of worship. Worship is not relegated to a song. Worship is not relegated to a time of service. Worship is what we must do every day of our lives. It is, what we, it is bringing God into view. It is putting God in front. It is making God the center. It is making God the focus. And so a common discipline is that we all seek to serve God and worship him. So we had, this, had common doctrine. There's common fellowship. There's common discipline. And lastly, there's common possessions. Here's, here's what happens. The people realize, here's the second thing that will happen when you totally surrender to God. The first thing that will happen is heaven's message becomes clear. The second thing is there's a detachment from your possessions. One of the reasons why people can't get close to God like they need to be is because they're attached to their stuff. You're not taking that from me. You're not taking, listen, today is July 1st, and, 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 um, there's some shows that are releasing today. 
You're not taking that from me, Pastor. Loving hip-hop, you're not taking that from me, Pastor. Scandal, you're not taking that from me, Pastor. Pa Listen, you're not taking that nice car that I have from me. You're not taking that large bank account that I have from me. You're, you're, not, taking, you're not taking these nice shoes. I love this lifestyle that I live. You can't have it. We hold on to stuff. But, but I'm not trying to take anything from you. I'm trying to encourage you to realize it's not yours anyway. And God gave it to you so you can give it away. So you can use what he gave to you to give to somebody else so that they can see by your giving what God's like. Because the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God took his most prized possession. God took the jewel of heaven and God gave it to us. So what is it that you have that you hold precious, that you won't let go? They had common possessions. They had all things in common. Listen, if you had food, I have food. Listen, if you got money, listen, my kids, here, let me help you understand. My, we have common possessions in our house. If I got money, guess what my kids have? Money. My kids don't have, they don't have jobs. When they say, Daddy, I want, guess who gets it for them? Daddy. We got common possessions. Right? Their food is my food. Right? No. Right? Right? My wife would say, no, don't you steal the kids' food. That's their food, right? But we share common possessions. We have a, a roof over our head. We live in the same house, right? We, we take care of each other. We make sure. I, listen, a selfish person only takes care of their needs and doesn't care about the needs of others. What father would live in a home where he has clothes and he has food and his children don't, right? Will you pull up to the table and you say, I got my dinner. Where's yours? Right? That's, that's, the world is selfish. I got mine. You better get yours. You see, this transformation was that we're on a mission so that we'll have this common doctrine, the teachings of Jesus will be common among us. The fellowship that we have will be common, that it won't be about what, what background, what socioeconomic status we have. It'll be about us coming together and loving each other and, and proclaiming the wonderful works of God, that we'll, there'll be common disciplines. We'll pray together. We'll study God's word together. We'll connect together in fellowship and in worship together. And it won't just be when we're corporate. It'll also be when we're personal. And then there's common possessions. Everything we have is God's. And will take all that he's given us to expand his kingdom and advance his gospel. There was common accord. There was a common sound. One band. One sound. One interest. And that interest was God's glory. And there was a common mission. There was a common mission to take the word of God and transform the lives. The Bible says they went from house to house to house. And the Lord added to the church such as should be saved. And so we don't, all, we don't need to be afraid of the work of the Holy Spirit. When this mighty rushing wind comes in, when this sound from heaven comes in, God will transform us and God will transform the world around us. Imagine if you were a farmer and you heard that mighty rushing wind come. You couldn't save your crops. All you could do was trust God, that he'd take care of you. And so I submit to you, don't try to save everything in this life. Surrender to the one who's able to give life and give it abundantly.